Josh? Hey, Flip. How's it going? Hey, man. You know. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you fine. You want to talk for a second so I can make sure that the Twitch stream is Sure, yeah. Apologies for being a few minutes behind. Uh, I'm calling in from mobile, and it's always a little bit of a uh, uh, confusing path to get in. But oh, I think right. I've got it handled mostly now. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, you sound you sound good. You sound like you're calling from a phone. Um, I am calling from a phone. Yeah. Cool, cool. How's it going? Where are you at? In what dis yeah, undisclosed I am, location? I I should say yeah, I should say <clears throat> undisclosed location. But I yeah. think the the project that I have, um, uh, the ship that I have tied myself to, <laughs> 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 that we will soon see uh, what becomes of it. Um, cool. I happen to be at the uh, Dorian's writing camp for um, the, the East Coast. So there's a, um, a riotous crew of um, seething maniacs uh, beneath me right now. And I've, I've locked <laughs> myself away in the attic. Uh, and, and I'm calling in to relieve you of your, your duties. Uh, how many hours into the stream are we so far? Um, we are about halfway there, almost exactly. Incredible. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was great to rewatch uh, hypernormalization this morning. I feel like you need to take it every, like once a year, you know? Totally. You just have to take it in again. Yeah, it hits every time. It is really, it's, yeah, it's in a, a league of its own. Quite, quite. I agree. Yeah, it's a, it's a good work. Um, it was, the, it was one of the ones that I think like while I was in school, I might've said this in the stream. Um, it came out right at the end of the time that I was in school and I think it like helped somewhat radicalize me uh, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah. What's the um, what's the year on it? Is it twenty twenty sixteen? Is it? It's really twenty sixteen. Oh. Yeah, I think it's twenty sixteen. If it's not twenty sixteen, I'm lying, and it was a different Adam Curtis film that radicalized me. <laughs> that's funny yeah uh i think no that makes sense yeah 2016 that's um that's got to be it um yeah i was thinking about um there's one by him that i really like that's the three-part series all watched over by machines of love and grace yeah and i think that had like a similar effect on me i think that is it 2011 or is it 2013 i don't remember but Maybe it's 2011, but I saw it in 2013, and it just it had a similar kind of thing to what you're describing, where it was just like it happened at the right time, and it put a lot of ideas together in a way that, um, I, well, I mean, are kind of muddled <laughs> as they are in the like the classic Adam Curtis type of way, yeah. but um, also had the the wonderful effect of just like fuel putting fuel into the hopper, and yeah, yeah, yeah it really. Um, it really went a long way for me. And I feel like a big part of like, I don't know, they, there's a few pieces that are formative in your growth as an artist and like just these certain milestones that you look back on and you're like, yeah, that was, that was like the signpost and that directed me down one of the forking paths. And totally. yeah, yeah. It's important to know what those are. Totally. Yeah. I 100% agree with that. How's the rest of the, how's the rest of the stream? Um, thing? I've been checking in periodically throughout the day while traveling and um well we we crashed twice unfortunately really uh, only two yeah you, i was i mean i was praying that we would not crash at all um but yeah we did crash at one point i was trying to open like call of duty or something to play with a yeah. friend and it, it crashed so this won't be uh the vod will be separate i think in more than one uh, Have you considered uh, not mining Bitcoin while you're? <laughs> I can't stop mining <laughs> Bitcoin. If I, I know you can't. I know you're, it's a sunk cost. You're in too deep now. If I'm not mining Bitcoin, someone else is mining Bitcoin, and that's Bitcoin that I can never get. That's that's very true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Missed opportunities. Yeah, I gotta Indeed. hash. I gotta hash these codes, dude. <laughs> Uh, I was thinking about um, speaking of speaking of the Sigma grind set. Um, we we've been talking a lot recently about divisions between work and life, and the um, I was going to say the potentials, but the reality of those things 
collapsing into each other, uh, especially in terms of remote work, in terms of the pandemic, and uh, a, a lot of trajectories that were uh, we were on track for already. They were already happening, but now it just like um, the the curve uh, accelerated. It just picked up pace really quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I realized like you've been doing that kind of work uh, for quite a while. And one of the maybe probably around the time of hypernormalization, actually I could I know what <laughs> I know what the show is that didn't sell, so I know why I had to do all of the extra work and, and work around mm-hmm. the clock. So mm-hmm. I could place it in a timeline. Um, but I was thinking maybe we could riff for a little bit about um, being a freelancer and living on the computer for for your art, but also for your socializing, but also for your business and trying to put those in the right categories. Uh, that might be an appropriate theme. Absolutely. Tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Happy, happy to, happy to riff on that. That feels like the, like uh, the curse, but I guess some would also call it the blessing. Um, someone mm. in the chat said the good screen versus the bad screen. Exactly. Good screen, bad screen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The problem is that both of those screens are the exact same screen. There's not even a separation between the good and the bad screen for me. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I yeah, work. The problem is, bro. It's yeah. Not, it's not deregulation. It's not the collapse of labor protections. It's just that you don't have two screens. That's all. You need two screens, bro. <laughs> yeah. We, we just throw uh, analysis of the political economy out the window. We get everybody two screens. Utopia. Yep, yep, we fixed it. You heard it here, folks. I'm gonna shut the stream down. We're we're done. It took it took that many that many hours to figure it out. That's all it was. Yeah, it was like we had to show proof of work. That's what it was. We yeah, just, yeah, just proof of work. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, like, I, I, I was, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I I just well, I, was, I, I, was, <laughs> I I work t- like ten to twelve hours a day on my computer. Yeah. And then I sign out of the VPN that my work has up for us. And then I, I close Unreal Engine, the program I work in for work. And then at times, depending on the project, I open up Unreal Engine again uh, mm. to work on my own work. Um, and that, that like lack of line between the two provided by like the work from home um, is like, I feel like there's just what, like what line it's the exact same thing. I could, I could be doing mm-hmm. both of them at the same time, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I used to, um, I forget where I picked up this term, um, but I would call it tool fatigue. Uh-huh. Where for me, it's, it's almost exactly what you're describing where I would freelance. Um, I was fortunate enough at the beginning that I had more or less regulated hours because I was going on site to do the freelancing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause it would often involve in the case of photography, you were, you were uh, doing Photoshop for a hard proof for something. So you'd have to be on site to do the digital work because you'd have to compare it to the physical output. Uh, you know, say you're making a run of prints or something like that. Mm-hmm. And so that for me would look like, you know, you clock in, you do eight hours, maybe you go a little bit over depending on what the project is. Uh, but then you would get home and you try to squeeze in, let's say from like 7.30 to midnight, you'd squeeze, squeeze in another like four and a half hours of Photoshop work using mm-hmm. like the exact same muscle memory and all the tools from your day job. And at a certain point, like you can do that for a while, but you start to develop this, uh, this response to just opening the program. Um, And I mean, there's a few different ways of dealing with it. Some people just pick up like other hobbies and use other programs for their, for their art practice. Um, But my, my feeling was like, maybe I'm paraphrasing Mike Pepe here that um, you are engaged, like you're actually in the field. So the, the critical work that you produce using those same tools are informed by the, reality of how they exist in the world and what they mean in the broader professional complex of just media and signs and making images and advertisements and uh, whatever the project happens to be. So I I felt like that was, um, I don't know, I don't know, maybe like a, 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 a cost that was, was built into it. But um, 
rather than trying to opt out of it and do Photoshop as a day job and, um, I don't know, mix MP3s as a hobby, uh, my feeling was that it was like the, the path was up and through in yeah. that you could understand what this image meant in the world. And then through your practice, you can incorporate those insights into meaningful images that could then steer broader, uh, more significant large scale decisions later on. Maybe that's, maybe that's just self aggrandizing and <laughs> too important for, for the kind of weird stuff that we get up to as artists. But I think that was the hope at least at the time. I don't, yeah, I, I don't think that it's self aggrandizing. I mean, like, I don't see in that, like, uh, in that, uh, analysis of it any like uh delusion about like what the product of, of like, what the artwork does in the world once you're able to like uh do that like uh transcribing of like understanding how the the professional uh the, the image functions professionally and then how that same tool set can be used to generate new meaning because of that understanding mm -hmm. like there's no delusion about like how it affects the, the professional world again it like could or it also might just not um the th the thing that i like mm. sometimes run up against in in that sense is like my job particularly i get i have a lot easier time at work uh by like throwing criticality someone out the door for mm -hmm. yeah uh, for the sake of like pr productivity um, and like there was, this is something that I maybe like starting to work through personally. Um, and maybe this just comes with like, I, I've been in this field for now four years, uh, since I graduated. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, the times that I've not been like, uh, at an institution, meaning like the, every year, except for like two years that I was part of like this, uh, like attempt at an like a, 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 a para institution as well as like my year at Bard, um, yeah. my my like ability to critically uh, think about the things that I was doing in my art practice, I wouldn't say that my ability diminished, but like uh, it, it's like an unpracticed language, right? In which like I stop yeah. uh, checking myself on like assumptions that I was making within the work. Uh, because I wasn't checking myself on the assumptions that I was making at work, right? And if the work that I'm making and being at work are the exact same sort of like muscle memory, it's really easy to just get lost in that sauce. Um, so for me, it's been super beneficial to like force myself into these like parent institutional spaces or like uh, places in which critical discourse happens surrounding art, right? Like from Mike Pepe's mm -hmm. lecture or Mike Pepe's panel was insanely exciting for me because I was like, oh, like it's been a minute since I've heard people talk <laughs> about the things that I'm interested in, in art, uh, in such, uh, critical and like, uh, like academic ways even too. I don't know. I, I love that shit. Right. Like I get off on like crit mm. for three hours. That shit's that's, fun. That's the thing. This, this shit is actually fun when you care about it. For real. But Absolutely. The problem is like, why is so much of art and participating in institutions so boring and why do you have to like why why does it suck yeah yeah i, I want to throw like one more thing into the mix here which is about um where we're, uh i i feel like part of this is downstream of the professionalization of art is yeah. that um I, I think kind of what you're describing may be most clearly indicated in the way that you allocate your time uh, and your attention is that you can kind of do one job or the other. And mm -hmm. we're talking about this hybrid space where you use the same tool, you, sp you spend time in front of the um, uh, good screen and bad screen are the same screen for, uh, right, right. To, to keep it easy and mimetic. Um, but there's something else that happens when, um, when it's not possible to have a part-time job, reproduce yourself, meet your overhead, and instead you have to become this like permanent freelancer or conversely, if you have success in the art world, um, you are now a professional enterprise and you have to optimize all of your resources towards performing that same thing. And so what you get are these divergent paths where there are uh, relatively few people. I feel like you and I are of the generation and of the, um, you know, the developmental phase of the first world right now where we 
don't really have support structures for for arts in, in any meaningful sense and said we have like visibility on platforms uh, but my feeling is that we're kind of like the last of this thing um, of people who care about doing art and having institutions and making things that maybe are not don't have the enormous visibility of platforms because they don't lend themselves to it because we're trying to do something that is fundamentally different of a higher more like a critical rigorous level uh, but it, in the, the near future, like, I just, I don't think that thing is going to be possible because you're either going to have to be a freelancer or you'll experience a tiny bit of success in the art world and you'll have to steer immediately into that. And so the opportunity for cross-pollination between those two things where your experience in the actual field can, um, can tell you about like the type of images that you make and what that means as they circulate through society, like that that ability to be in the, the hybrid uh, space is, go is just going to be lost. Mm -hmm. uh, you're either going to be professionalized or um, precariatized, uh, maybe. Right, right, right. I, is, is it like, um, am I like functioning like the, under, under some delusion to believe that like the, diver, di the di divergent path, like the one, like you either like hard commit to like selling art or uh, and, and, and like making decisions within the work that are market driven or you hard commit to being like a freelance worker and like abandon art because of the like amount of work right. one must do to exist like that that is worse than the precarity of like working 12 hours a day freelance and then attempting mm -hmm. to like allocate four or five hours after that to uh, creative labor for your work like I can't tell what's right more of a fucked situation to be in neither of them seem ideal but at least in one of them the meaning that you're trying to produce outside of like your wage cut job is uh more meaningful to you because it's i mean potentially unless like the meaningful things to you are like market-based art decisions but i assume it's more meaningful because it's like uh closer to this like ideal quote unquote of making art that is like to find and make meaning of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, um, yeah, yeah. Let's put this in contrast. Let's say like, um, so if you're working, let's say to make the math easy, you're working uh, 10 hours a day and then you're squeezing out another uh, four to six hours for your art practice using the same tools. I feel like, there's something that is important uh, and and um, wonderful to be gained through existing in both of the worlds, but uh, I would much rather do the freelance for five hours instead of ten, <laughs> and then uh, I feel like the balance needs to be tipped. Like that's yeah. that's kind of the thing. It's not that like um, you don't want to get rid of one in favor of the other. But I feel like the wages and the benefits should be strong enough to support you through selling your labor as a freelancer that you can afford to go about your artwork and never worry about professionalizing it. Because what, what starts to happen when I'm trying to think of an example of like, and also just someone that I dislike who I would want to name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe instead of that, like, let's say, for example, of the any number of like uh, artists that we've known in the last few years who have gone on to like really significant, like mainstream success, uh, institutional prestige and all this stuff. Uh -huh. um, there's something that happens where it's like, yeah, I remember when so-and-so was producing uh, JPEGs in 2010, just uploading them to a blog. And like, that was a really cool thing. Um, and then, you know, now extrapolate that out and say they're like five or 10 years down the road and they're still kind of coasting on that type of uh, uh, conversation, but they're um, maybe what you had hinted at earlier, just like totally untethered from the realities of like how blogs and digital image production work or, or mm -hmm. all of that type of stuff. And um, they're, they just like, they haven't made like, say for example, they haven't made a meme <laughs> in like 10 years. <laughs> and the whole practice is about memes. And it's like, well, actually what is, what is going on here? This is some, some sort of like legacy brand that's like an artifact of the earlier internet or like, is this even, like it, it seems to lose both cultural relevancy 
but then also lend itself to just purely becoming a financial asset, which like evacuates all of the exciting things and potentials of the art world at once. Mm. So you get things that are both like irrelevant, but also literally sometimes the instrument of siphoning wealth out of the society that right, right, right. swim through as <laughs> hybrid freelancers and artists. So it's like they're, they're kind of they're, they're kind of uh, dinging you twice for it, um, but yeah, yeah. I feel, I feel like that's um, I don't know. Maybe maybe this is one of the things that uh, it's just been slow to develop because we we were all like uh, too naive when when the art world um, was totally remapped by social media, at least at the early entry levels, and and maybe now we'll have a corrective period. If the total, if the bottom doesn't drop out of the economy, um, as it right. most definitely will in the next uh, uh, few months. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah. feel like because of right, like the the pendulum swung real hard to one direction when the art world uh, defined like what it means to be an artist within the, the, the like uh, society with us with social media present. Um, like mm. the, it, it just almost feels like there's no way that anything but a reactionary phase can happen mm. next. Right. Oh, like, that's interesting that like we will swing the, the pendulum will swing once again, hard to the other side. Uh, and like, I don't know what that means. Like I'm sort of just thinking out loud right now, but mm -hmm. like a, almost like an exit type thing, like Brad's what Brad's that, suggesting. Is is the pendulum in terms of the uh, attention of the audience or is the pendulum pendulum in terms of um, the goals of the artists the, who, who are the people that would exit artists? Yeah. Yeah. The, like the, the sort of like aspirations of young artists really is what I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I guess like the, the evidence that sort of support the claim is like what is happening to grad art programs. Um, yeah. Like why, why is there like a, a less interest in them? Um, mm hmm and like what are grad, grad art programs actually doing for young students that are coming out of them? Um, like, is that, is, is that model, that funnel, that like delusional funnel that used to like, that tricked me and so many other young <laughs> artists in, in their twenties in like 2015 and 16, like is, uh, do young people coming out of undergrad still see that as like a, even an option. And I, I, wager like more more often no than yes uh and because of that like i feel like everything that's that used to be quote unquote downstream from that decision to go to grad school um mm. becomes also uninteresting right like it's like getting a gallery re representation uh like is like a, a cool if it happens but like not banking on it um like art fairs I mean, what galleries are even left to represent you at this point. right 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 like uh, <laughs> the middle is gone because of everything right um but yeah i'm wondering then like yeah. if the response is just like oh like leave like stop making art for the art world entirely like everyone collectively the art world continues mm -hmm. to trade these mm -hmm. like historical assets at that point right like the cause yeah, yeah. works and whatnot become just the thing that they're actually that they actually are but are being sort of like piloted as artworks um they just become more honest maybe and mm -hmm. the the real meaning the like actual art gets made outside like in parainstitutional spaces on discords you know like uh yeah. can can these communities hold a space that is uh like that I, as an artist, participate in it, feel uh, uh, like sustained by, or like like that that it's enough of a, a thing to keep me going in my like pursuit mm -hmm. of whatever the practice might might ask for. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These well, these are these are the questions that I think we're we're sorting out in real time with um, whatever the the blog can grow to become and whatever. Um, yeah, the uh, I mean, let's just let's just frame this out in case there's people because I feel like we're we're traversing some familiar territory. But in case there's people who have not heard this before, um, we were in a specific period of um, in the last few years there was a, this tremendous aesthetic rupture that completely remapped any anthropological, uh, ethnographic, academic understanding of what internet culture was going to produce. Like the significance of what has unfolded in the last few years with the reactionary turn 
of internet subcultures is of such tremendous cultural, political, historical significance um, that one would imagine that it set the discourse for uh, basically all of our extended peer group. But instead, we find ourselves in a situation where there's, I can count on pretty much a single hand, the total amount of artworks given institu an institutional platform in the United States uh, on, on these topics, right? So if, if you look at European programs throughout the whole uh, uh, EU, there is some good stuff that, that addresses this, um, but there's been basically zero institutional resources. I mean, I think we might be able to literally count it by the dollars if we look at <laughs> basically Rhizome's program. Like they were the only ones who thought it was important enough to devote programming resources to it. Uh, and so that in contrast with like the significance of what unfolded in that period, um, that's, that's a contradiction that uh, we, we just constantly need to, to point out because that's the void that we can fill. Um, I, I think, um, let me, I'm, I'm trying to keep a really big frame on this because I feel like this is important, but there should have been previously um, before artists, uh, or I guess artists are now, artists are now opting out of working with institutions and opting into working with platforms. Maybe it's coercive. I think it's a, just the coercive uh, laws of competition driving people onto platforms. But institutions now in this incredibly polarized uh, society, wealth polarization, I mean, not political polarization, but we, I mean, we live in the most unequal society since the fucking pharaohs. There isn't a limit to philanthropic money. The institutions have more funding than ever. So why are artists opting out of the professional assembly line to an art career where you would previously show at project spaces, work your way up to mid-tier galleries, work your way up to big galleries and blue chip and whatever, like just normally vetting an asset and uh, finding a stabilized price and it increases over time given interest and just, just regular like functioning, <laughs> functioning capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but instead we're in this period where the institutions should have been able to retain work like, um, well, let's name an artist because it's someone we like. <laughs> Institutions should have been able to retain Brad. Mm -hmm. Brad's work has so much interest in it and so much relevance that there should have been a mechanism within the existing institutions to be able to pay him more than he could through crowdfunding. And previously in a functioning model of maybe uh, before neoliberalism, um, there were these mechanisms that would be able to fold in antagonisms and contradictions, and you could be the tenured professor who is also very grumpy and disagreed with everything the institution said, but you were secure enough in your job, and there was something that like, well, if I exit to my own substack or I start my own newspaper it, to keep a period specific, um, I'll just simply make so little money I won't be able to sustain myself. So what we're seeing here is it, it, a failure in, or an inability of the institution to capture the value that the artists are producing. And so they're moving into the platforms. I mean, I guess this is, this is the specific like period that we, we live in where there's um, in a really significant infra elite conflict between uh, old money and new money, which is playing itself out through institutional hegemony and uh, platform hegemony or the, like the new emergent hegemony. But um, I feel like all of these things have to be threaded together that um, for like the kind of stuff that we're doing through Do Not Research and these kind of conversations, like this right here should not be a Twitch stream. It should be a funded panel discussion at an institution, right. <laughs> like all of those things. So, so essentially like this is, this is a wager. This is the wager that if you want to publish through an institution, you're going to get $150 or you can choose to publish with your friends and you'll get $50, <laughs> but you're already a precarious freelancer. Like a hundred dollars doesn't make or break. The margins are becoming so small. It mm. might get down to like, it, you get an additional 50 bucks to publish through conventional legacy media. Or, I mean, if, at a certain point, if you just break even, um, you're self-funded anyway. Like, right. so, so what do these institutions have if their discourse sucks and also they can't uh they can't pay you uh there's no there's no retention for for the talent and this is essentially like we're describing this point like Substack, um just talent from uh, uh legacy media publications hemorrhaging out to Substack because they can't get a platform for their ideas it's the same thing playing out in the art world mm -hmm. that being said 
Okay, so we just went through the whole like libertarian. I'm I'm really on one now because I've been go. talking about this a lot. Fucking go. <laughs> uh, maybe after you've been streaming for so long, so you can uh, you can uh, take take the wheel, <laughs> maybe dude. Maybe you're relieved. <laughs> um, my feeling is that what we're discovering is that there's a certain peop- there's a certain group of people who are maybe just too dumb and stubborn <laughs> to really uh, acculture themselves or shift what they're doing to fit the platform. So. Um, in my, uh, my hope is that like, we can, we can restore this balance and this role of institutions in society. And that for the short term, being on the platforms, being a podcast and a YouTube channel and a Twitch stream and the, all of the things that we're, we're self-publishing, like that can be a life raft that redocks with this giant institutional mothership, uh, provided that the the institutional titanic can course correct and avoid the iceberg Be, mm. but i'm not i'm given the way that things are unfolding in the institution uh, where we are now strange bedfellows with the techno libertarians of silicon valley uh mm. because we just simply cannot access funding and platforms through the existing institutional structures in the in the u.s specifically right. um yeah so that that brings us to here um and maybe um um, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what you have uh, cooking up in the, in the next year and who you're finding it uh, easy and or maybe not easy, but possible to, to work with. Mm. But my, my feeling is that um, these things are not really going to correct themselves and that we might have to build an alternative because I just I don't see like. I don't see the do not research uh, <laughs> museum retrospective show happening uh, anytime in the next decade, if, if at all, you know, my, my faith in the existing institutions, as much as I abstractly and um, diagrammatically believe and understand in their importance, I just do not see these. I mean, they're just like hanging the collection of the trustees on the wall. That's like essentially what, the building has been reduced to. So, right, right. so you and I, uh, as not producing these financial assets, are going to have to find something else to do with our time um, and, and some other way to access resources, which puts us on the platform, puts us um, on Twitch right now. <laughs> right, right. And not particularly uh, financially in any sort of different position to than prior to being on Twitch, but like you said, at least with an audience that is mm. more substantial than an, like no audience because right the institution is not a place that is particularly interested mm-hmm. in many many of the things that like artists like us make um yeah man i don't know i feel like you know you've been closer to the like the dragon's cave than i have on the quest <laughs> the dragon's cave <laughs> as, as far as the dragon's cave being like the you know the the museum and the, the like capital i institution um i've only like watched yeah, yeah i've only watched people sort of like get into it and uh either like become dragons themselves or uh like I don't know, get fucked by it. So like, I don't see it as a, like the odds are not in our favor for the, like you said, the, the museum, uh, or not maybe the museum, the institution being the, the thing that is able to like sustain what we as like artists and, 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 mm you know creatives want it to do and are doing right now right like we're moving at like way faster of a speed than they're able to even like attempt to keep up with right like both in terms of like the level of discourse as well as the right uh, the like our ability to make work dealing with the discourse that we're dealing with right so like by the time the shit that some people are making becomes relevant in this in the sense of the museum like it might not be actually relevant to talk about. Um, I, yeah, I, I like you don't really see it as the, I don't see the dock being there, honestly, um, to like redock with, uh, un- unfortunately. I'm like hopeful uh, that, right. that like, well, I, I still believe in it, you know? Mm. I think, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah, I mean, um, hmm, hmm. 
I feel like uh, it's useful to go through the the schematic and go through the diagram to understand like what is a functioning institution supposed to be mm. and how is a platform um, not, not really <laughs> an alternative to it. And like, yeah, like what, what are the ways that they're different? Right. This is, I think the utility of Mike's work of like, this is like, okay, what is a museum? What is a database? Uh, are those things identical? Are they different? And, and when you have to give a firm definition and differentiate those terms, it's, it, it does actually, um, force you to understand how they function in society and uh, the, right. all the broader things connected to it. Um, but I, I think there's um, there's uh, two things here. We'll, we'll take these one at a time. The the speed of institutions versus the speed of culture is uh, certainly an issue, but I feel like my preferred solution for it would be to have um, essentially uh, like smaller pockets of uh clustered or, or sorry nested within the institutions because um i think there's something that is like when the institutions move slow it can be frustrating but it can also be good yeah because totally. institutions can sorry say that again but yeah totally. i'm agreeing i'm agreeing uh yeah 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 because i mean otherwise there's this is one of the things of differentiating what is a platform what's an institution because um let's say for example a an institution that moves too quickly will have every meme of the month every meme of the week or day and it would might look more like TikTok, and then you look back at a year's worth of programming and you're like i didn't actually learn that much from it and what would have been more meaningful was like a survey of like what was this particular moment and how did this thing fit into a broader historical narrative and and that type of a thing mm-hmm. um so i mean I'm, I'm a little bit playing devil's advocate because most of i feel like most of my uh uh, uh, provocations in the last few years have been something similar to what you're describing, that the, the institutions are moving insufficiently quickly, especially in like the discourse of photography and the um, really, I mean, at, at this point, the response kind of never happened, that it, it just never properly responded to what the presence of uh, graphics editing software meant in mm-hmm. the, the, the context of like photography other than um, making like creative uh, I mean, there's there's a few legacy artists whose work is important, but uh, it just just broadly was um, it was incorporated into the, into the institution in like in Stephen Shore's retrospective, there were three iPads where you could scroll his Instagram, like that mm-hmm. was that was kind of the effect of it, rather than I mean all just worlds of material that we traverse and post in the Discord every day and, and this kind of a thing. Um, but to 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 go back, this is maybe not a perfect segue here. Um, but uh, we're kind of cross-threading between the institutions of art and the institutions of um, uh, university education and that kind of stuff. Mm. Because my feeling is that the barometer for this would be, um, you had mentioned opting out. And when people begin to voluntarily opt out of higher education in the, you know, let's say lowercase p professional art world, um, or the, the formalized capital A art world, maybe that's a better description. When people begin to opt out of that and then opt into making work on the platform, that is the, that is the market, uh, that, that's the disintermediation um, of like total institutional uh, failure and, and collapse. And that yeah. like, it's not even, <laughs> I mean, people have to weigh the cost of participating in culture and hoping to make the life raft or the arc for the future society is so personally burdensome to me in that I can't afford to assume a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt to, uh, you know, float the cost of having these institutions in society. It's Mm -hmm. just like, I, I literally can't do it. So you would rather become like a, a content piggy for the, for the platform. And, and I think we're, we're getting to that point. Um, Certainly, let's say, for example, just because I'm surrounded by the very talented and creative uh, hyperpop people who uh, make music but also make merchandise, a lot of that merchandise is at the tier of like uh, a university executed artwork that would provoke a critical conversation that we would have in a room with what should be in a functioning society, a dozen people who are co-invested and interested in ideas and provokes an interesting conversation that is intellectually enriching and, and all of this stuff. But um, <laughs> the institutions just clearly aren't doing that. So uh, I, I generally consider these people to be um, artists in the way that, uh, that we are, but we're just 
navigating different decision matrices in their path to professionalization, mm -hmm. where uh, what happened as, you know, basically making memes on a blog and posting photographs to my social media and Tumblr, um, I was then invited into the, the halls of the art world to, to make uh, collectible things for, you know, small edition, high price point. Um, those things were so dysfunctional within just a few short years, evidenced by the, the bubble collapsing of the, the post-internet period, uh, that the people who followed up produced things that were, you know, of equal rigor and equal, equally interesting, but were not invited into the, uh, the, the formal halls of the, the capital A art world, and so had to go for scale rather than a uh, high price point. So instead of selling one piece, like a, a 60 by 40, for ten thousand dollars, you know, you would sell, um, you know, just multiply the math out, and you would sell the prints for, uh, you know, ten dollars, and you'd sell a thousand of them, and that was it. Pretend there's no production cost in any of this; just keep the math right, easy. Right, right. But um, like that, that seems like um, there's no upward mobility offered through the the direct path to professionalization that that functioned for decades previous. And uh, it seems to pretty much illustrate where we are now. I just, okay, so here, I'm, I'm, I'm ruthlessly caveating everything we say here mm -hmm. because um, we're cross-threading through so many different uh, um, critiques from both the, uh, the market angle, but also the institutional angle. My understanding of the landscape that we've just laid out is that we've built the alternative to it, is that we've built a grad school that better educates you, has the conversations, and cost five dollars right uh, forgive me as an occupational ha hazard but i'm constantly pitching now i just so thoroughly internalized neoliberalism that i can never not pitch i can't just have a normal <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always in business mode uh but I, I i would hope that we're not the only thing that does this that's that that's my feeling i feel like we're the first symptom of all of these broader machinations and, and institutional failures in society. But following us, there's going to be a bunch of other things that just don't become like, it's not going to be Vosh, you know, it's not going to be PewDiePie. It's not going to be these influencer personalities that collect followings. Like that's how social media has brokered it now. But I feel like people are going to collect in smaller and smaller groups, like very dense groups that are very dedicated and form these things that, you know, we're calling it an institution. Maybe somebody else will call it a DAO. Maybe someone else will call it a uh, writing uh, collaborative. Maybe they'll just call it a magazine. They'll just call it a digital magazine. Mm. But um, yeah, it, it, it seems like as those things get progressively narrow, uh, narrower and smaller, the, the ties between the, the community constituents will just become so strong. Um, yeah, that, that it will be hard to really call it like a channel in the way that we have uh, uh, now in that like you just be a fan of Vosh or you're an anarcho Bidenist or you're like, you know, um, you're you're like you you watch uh, Hassan on a, on a Twitch stream. It'll be it'll be, I think, smaller, more dedicated. And um, yeah, ideally, ideally. Uh, uh, give uh, the platforms for things that are not um, um, subject to the like competitive attention economy of constantly having to go to go viral. Right. Um, yeah. So you get, you get a, um, I essentially I'm describing like a, a dark forest, um, uh, uh, prefiguring a dark forest on the existing web 2.0. Uh, Cause I don't know what the next one is going to be, but mm -hmm. thriving small discord servers, where people voluntarily opt out of older legacy institutions, um, specifically in the art world, but also in print media and, and everything else. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there's a part of me that like, and th this is something that uh, I worried. This is a anxiety that was instilled upon me after participating in like 2018, I think, uh, in a like. I guess we at the time we called it a residency, but it was like a summer in which uh, a group of people uh, who applied to be per partake in like uh, a program that is geared towards artists who make work that is not uh, institutionally mm. canonized. So like video art, sure. performance, uh, shit that we do, um, 
all the time already. Um, <laughs> One of ours. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it was like, a, in a lot of ways, like an early sleeper cell, uh, minus a couple of be bells and whistles that the sleeper cell, I think, brings to the table too. Um, but basically what had happened, we did this thing in the summer. It was incredibly fun. A lot of really great critical discourse. We were able to pull upon like each of our respective networks to pull in interesting people. And everybody paid like four or 500 bucks to be a part of this mm -hmm. thing for the entire summer. We were able to pay everybody that participated in it administratively, et cetera. It was very transparent. Um, the thing that we ran up against was uh, money like funding the project, right, is like always the thing that like breaks the project in a lot of ways, as well as like administ administrative issues came in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering when there's like, in this future, there's like 50 of these communities, right? Each one of them respectively has like two to 300 members, the size of the sleeper cell, maybe slightly smaller, um, all uh, <laughs> looking for alternative funding structures <laughs> from, the from the same pot of money right sure, sure. um like where uh like I, I don't think we have to answer this right now obviously i i it's a fear that i have that like a plat like a, a a wall that will come up against um collectively is like without like we we are we might be at a different position than other communities to to find funding to continue to do this kind of stuff i would love to quit my job and work on anything for DNR, quote unquote, full time. Uh, right. And I wouldn't even ask for as much, like I would ask enough to like live, right? And because both of those things, like both making my work as well as working for something like that would be a, a, like a huge pleasure, right? Uh, and I just, I don't know that I see if, uh, I, like I, it's hard for me to get past my anxieties around mm figuring out how to like fund these things because like i think we're onto something and i think that like uh pulling from wealthy people interested in like investing in in like these newer models of 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 uh like quote unquote institution or D daos or whatever um i think that's a good model for us right now because we're kind of somewhat early in on it but like the 30th community that comes along might be really interesting, but just might not have any money to pull from. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's a good point. And I, I, I don't know that that's a problem. Honestly, it's like, like this, this is shit that will like figure itself out as we go. Um, but yeah, it's something right. that the, I, I the think potential about. donors are an increasingly small pool as well. Right. There's not a lot of, yeah. Yeah. It, it just uh, throws well, it throws a wrench in this idea that like in the future there hopefully will be like lots of smaller communities um that call themselves whatever magazines institutions DAOs um that are able to like foster the kind of discourse and critical space that like otherwise these institutions that are n not working used to hold mm -hmm. and then potentially replace them um Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'm just um hmm, i'm trying to think of like what is the right way to to approach this because i think you're you're right there's a um there's a specific period that we're a part of and um the opportunities that are going to be available for us in the next few years are not going to be available for um some of the people who follow right. um because time moves in one direction um <laughs> capital moves in one direction uh history just uh, uh moves forward and um one of the things that indicates that is that um es essentially like we laid out before the the appropriate um what one might describe as feeder leagues or an assembly line to having a professional art career where you start mm -hmm. small you work your way up if you are a band you'd play uh, your local neighborhood, then the local venue, and then you uh, go on a tour, and then you get booked for stadiums, and like you know, you just slowly work your way up by proving interest. Mm. And instead, what happened was um, people who produced things to an audience of a you know tiny group of people, but were uh, uh, you know interesting or had some type of an insight, 
those things like just immediately moved from the periphery into the um, the, the main halls and the, the the cost like literally in plotting the valuation of some of these works like it you know they increased uh, uh, orders of magnitude um, in the the speculative market or or whatever. Um, previous to that, like I think that symptom for for it to happen that quickly, it shows that the 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 regular process of vetting an asset price or going about a professional career path had already collapsed because the speed at which a JPEG became a $10,000 painting then became a $100,000 painting, it was literally like six months. <laughs> I mean, maybe it was a year if you're like, if you're really generous for it, but it's uh, like the, the, the system was already, it had already crumbled. And so what we thought was, things moving at a, a timeline was just the perspective of, of a young person, like not really understanding um, the, the forces that were, were in motion. Um, so I think the thing that is probably the deciding factor for this thing, uh, for, for the uh, equation you're describing of how people who come after us choose to organize themselves into institutions or what their, um, what their game is going to be. Maybe we could throw, um, we could throw into this, like, it's, it's going to be that decision of opting out of institutions and opting into platforms, maybe as the, um, the deciding factor, uh, because, um, I mean, we're just going to be so far removed from it at a certain point that there, there won't be a conception as like a creative producer of like what it means to have a functioning institution and to set the discourse from the top. Because, I mean, it, you know, before Trump, before fake news, just it, American trust in um, institutions in like a very broad sense, not like specifically like the MoMA or art publications, like let's include museums, mm -hmm. but let's also include the New York Times, let's also include like uh, the, the Federal Reserve, or uh, right, right, right. Bro just broadly all institutions, like that trust is crumbling through um, the hollowing out of, of neoliberalism, where essentially these institutions that um, uh, ostensibly in, the, in, in an earlier era of the like the great compromise of between labor and capital and post World War II, uh, the U.S. Um, that like they serve some type of a public good, and the reason you trusted them is because your parents grew up um, massively benefiting from the role that those institutions played in society. But you know now it's like. Um, I think there was a poll. This is I'm, I'm going to totally flub the statistics because I don't remember it. But there was a poll administered to um, a, American um, Congress members about like what is the institution you most trust? <laughs> and for Republicans, it was the U.S. military, and for Democrats, it was Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly where we fucking are. Uh, so <laughs> you know we're at this point. Like we have enough hindsight that we remember the story of Jeff Bezos being a book salesman who like started in his parents' garage or whatever. Like everyone's going to know the mythology, mm -hmm. but the mythology is not going to be real because we saw these things come into existence. Like the, maybe the platform, maybe, sorry, not the platforms, maybe the institutions were already horribly dysfunctional previous to us coming into this art world. Mm -hmm. But our, our peer group got to like have one foot in each of those worlds. So we understand that there is a, a type of alternative that is possible. Mm -hmm. But my feeling is that say, for example, if you're 20 years old now, you're at the higher, you're at the higher like age bracket of like the memers that, um, you know, I, I've been writing about and that we talk to uh, on the stream and, and some of whom participate in the discord, uh, the world that they're going to have one foot in each of is going to be like, total neoliberal platform platform dystopia or like climate catastrophe militaristic uh just brutal state apparatus as like repression and the police force has a tank and riot gear all the time right. like, <laughs> there's not going to be like a hint of like I mean, essentially what I'm describing is like an accelerated trajectory of, of the vapor wave nostalgia for the 80s of like, there's going to be a point there to, maybe I should, I should spell that out. That there's a point in the past where there was a divergent path and the return to the aesthetic, the vibe, the, the feeling of the 80s was, is this 
hope to return to an era where different decisions could have been made, that there was a world that didn't involve Reagan and Thatcher and massive privatization and the largest upwards drift of wealth uh, in, in history at that time. And I think we're at a, a similar period now where um, the lever can be uh, uh, pulled. <laughs> I'm, mm. I'm just, I've rotted my brain so much in the past few years, I can only speak in memes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably problem. <laughs> but but we, we are at a similar kind of, we're at a similar decisive period where in the rupture of the Overton window, discursively accelerated by social media, just present in the news cycle and the, the emerging political factions that are happening now, um, we are at a specific moment of opportunity and um, it, it can be steered. Like the things we do are meaningful in, you know, not, not individually meaningful, but they're meaningful in that they have impact and, and we're in a moment where we can steer it. So if you can move it back, if you can privatize less, if you can um, essentially like that has been, that has been, this is maybe a good, uh, a, um, a good way to summarize the, the overarching like, um, theme that we've been discussing tonight but i feel like the provocation is that the way that at this stage of our like extremely dysfunctional society um produces legitimacy manufactures consent is through really really extensive uh efforts and resources put into messaging to cover up the fact that the overwhelming majority of people are feeling a squeeze that is so intense it's impossible to ignore like they've seen shopping malls um go from like these uh, exuberant expressions of consumerism and um uh, 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 early utopia and upwards growth and whatever and now they're just totally depopulated and defunct and been replaced by amazon like they they've kind of they've seen they've seen that happen so if there's some if there's some possibility to change the opinions and change the minds of um, let's say, uh, to put it in, in, in a term, like the media class PMC constituency that overlaps with the art world, like th those are people that we can reach that have vastly disproportionate representation in society. Mm -hmm. And if you could apply pressure to them, you'll do better than pulling the lever just by yourself. Mm -hmm. that, that is, I think, essentially the idea is like having this systemic this this diagrammatic uh, bird's eye view of how um how the society is operating how messaging is operating and finding like actually where is most impactful to me to act so i, I don't just have to be one more body in the protest that's i mean that it, it's meritable it's admirable but like maybe it's you can be more than just one canvasser you know maybe if you have the unique skills and interests of an artist like maybe there are more effective ways that you can act in society but the institutions are not going to allow you to do that so um maybe it's a temporary exit with the hope and the the intention to restore the legitimacy of of the institutions to rejoin totally. with them um yeah because i think okay just to maybe i'll throw it back to you after this <laughs> if we totally exit because i share your lack of faith and, and optimism for the institutions but we're basically exiting to the desert we're exiting to the carbon waste totally. like we're exiting to neo-feudalism and uh supply chains being disrupted and um king bezos uh, you know gives you universal basic drinking water and you have to do like you have to worship him in response They're like it's just going to get really bad really fast so yeah 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 i, I mean it comes back to the like somewhat to the trepidation that I had of like, is it worse to be uh, a wage cuck that works on your art afterwards or to be uh, an artist uh, entirely dictated by the market or to be uh, just a, a wage cuck without being an artist? Like the, the, uh, the, like exiting to me feels like you have to make one of those decisions uh, because right that's like all there is out there that that like the the, de the desert is only presented with like uh a couple of options and none of those options are in any way ideal or like sustainable um really like or a combination of the options is not sustainable right uh so yeah. i i agree that like we like if the institution whatever any institution like you can place it like the museum or whatever the grad grad school uh higher education doesn't self-correct by virtue of us like by what uh 
one virtue which is us leaving temporarily in order to dock again later right i feel like that is a pressure for that institution to self correct mm. and if it if it doesn't and like we're not able to help it like reorganize itself in a in a way that is uh like sustainable like dumb example being like them to fund projects that are actually being made today by artists rather than like mm. continue mm. to fund the same group of people that don't need funding for instance um like uh, um, unless unless you're able to correct like we have to make them correct like there's no other option like you're saying like it's that or we exit into a desert which doesn't provide <laughs> i mean like w w like the the other option is to try to like buckle down on platform capitalism and like just be like okay let's see how how long we can ride this one out for like how much mm -hmm. longer can i twitch stream and hope that my subs are gonna like keep coming in um yeah or make a Patreon. Like, how many more Patreons can be made uh, before OnlyFans, whatever the fuck platform is, before like that's not a sustainable option either. So, mm -hmm. I, I share, I, sh I share your, I, I, I have trepidation around the institution doing the thing, but I also share your optimism and like hope that it's the only thing that we can really do. I mean, it's a good idea too, right? Like the institution's already there, halfway made. To do the right thing like why not <laughs> that, yeah yeah they're they're well they're already equipped to it i feel like the art world is a is a very specific example of this because um i'm trying to think of another example let's say uh this is going to be a really stressed analogy but let's say like um the art world and the va <laughs> two <laughs> things that uh fit under the category of institutions but are very different um but um the art world is unique in that um, because it doesn't really, it doesn't have a use value. It's like always attached to uh, philanthropy or uh, aesthetics. And, um, you know, these things are things you look at rather than things you use in, in producing stuff. Um, austerity crunches the VA, squeezes the VA in a way that it doesn't squeeze the Whitney, for example. So when we're on a a specific, um, a specific trajectory of wealth polarization, of privatization, the amount of philanthropic money that gets introduced to um, the flows of uh, art museums in the U.S. specifically is very different from how we would describe uh, other institutions that are state-funded or, or something like that. Um, because it, what we do is like we <laughs> find ourselves in a very unique situation where um, austerity actually increases the amount of funding that's available through the institution. So right. uh, that's, I, I mean, without adding too many layers of, of complexity uh, uh, to this, um, it concentrates it at the top. One of the proposals that I liked in response to this was, um, and this was, this was tossed out of the suggestions very quickly. I'm, I'm still salty about it, but my feeling was that, um, you know, one could one could lobby the institutions to um, essentially allocate. We'd, we'd be talking about like less than one percent of their funding to um, subsidize the studio costs of um, mm. like a, an entire city of artists. Right. Uh, essentially, like one could lobby the Whitney uh, totally. to get them to pay for. You know, humble. We're not talking fancy studios here, but right. that's that's something that could very easily be achieved. And I feel like there's you know relatively attainable um uh, uh criteria that that could be introduced of like how do you make sure there's an equitable distribution of those resources well uh in the same way that you apply for an artist membership to an institution you would say that you know you, i think you literally just have to show like a postcard of a group show you've been in and then you get a uh like 75 percent discount to a moma um membership I, I i don't have a membership but I, I know people who do and um they literally showed a postcard so that's, Wait, that's, that's is that true yeah yeah that's all you have to do i borrowed i borrowed the card from um an artist who i mean he could afford one too that was <laughs> he could he could really afford that membership a few times over but uh he he's like yeah i literally brought a postcard from the group show i was in and they gave me the I, I mean, I think it's something like, I don't know, is it 100 bucks? Is it like 60 bucks? And then you get it for like a massively reduced price, which is supposed to subsidize, uh, you know, artists being involved in the institutions that they're in. But 
Uh, mm. I, I mean, we're, we're kind of losing, we're kind of losing, I feel like this is the Fisher insight here is that um, we're never going to, we're never going to be able to reach a point where subsidizing the cost within a specific profession eclipses the amount of state resources that could be mobilized through just regular political pressure. Mm. So the, the hazard that I feel like artists um, frequently fall into is thinking like, well, we should do some type of an organization here and then we should like target this thing. We should target that thing. And we, maybe we can get some of their money. But instead, I think um, you're already like pruning down your, your base of people to essentially be, um, like the historical beneficiaries of the uh, you know, the, the, the previous right. um, uh, uh, American society. That is, you know, um, uh, we already know who they are. We know where they live. Like it's already extremely concentrated. Um, and those are these tiny little pressure groups rather than like the indirect funding that just, um, you know, if you applied rent control to New York City rather than having the Whitney subsidized studios, that would be a much more meaningful contribution to the way that people navigate their lives and expenses, and it would produce way better art. <laughs> that's kind of the, the thing. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, maybe that, I feel like that's our, that's, our, that's our wedge. That's the sweet spot is that people are opting out of the platforms. They're thinking, of, they're opting out of the institutions, they're moving into the platforms, and, and we can kind of collect them uh, on, that, on that path of like, um, basically becoming resentful libertarians. We are like, no, there is some other alternative to this uh, privatization. And uh, like, you don't have to become a better entrepreneur. And by becoming a better entrepreneur, you evacuate all of the meaningful, wonderful things about your artwork and you just start producing content. Yeah. You know, we're, we're trying to stay above the, sorry to shit on all the, the content producers <laughs> tonight. But uh, yeah, yeah, you know, you want to you wanna believe that there's something something more, something that's part of a historical lineage, that's part of like an, an arc that moves forward through culture that isn't just a flash in the pan meme. Right, as right. Fun and interesting as those things are. Um, yeah, I mean. Yeah, there should the, be, there the, should the, be an alternative. The content producer is just a... Uh, a person that was previously like making meaning switching from like an uh, potentially like uh switching to a reactionary position like creating meaning dictated by like mm. the, the the market of takes um so yeah, yeah we should t totally shit on content production mm -hmm. as like a way of understanding <laughs> making things um yeah i mean this idea of like uh the like the the museum subsidizing artists studios uh then resulting in better art existing um because of like you know so many fucking reasons I, it makes me wonder like if i put my tinfoil hat on like is, is there a uh maybe this is not like even worth getting into but is, is there a anybody gaining anything from like the rate at which good art gets produced not like mm. be, being slowed down like do the museums mm. gain right. a life like a, a longer life expectancy by like being able to only like put out whatever like two good artists uh, or like canonize an artist every five years that is like worth canonizing like right w like, w w why because otherwise i'm like confused by the decision not to like do some of these things if they are so obviously going to make the amount of work that the museum can then, by virtue of it being good, like show and own mm -hmm. uh, and whatever, make assets out of, I don't even know if museums partake in that particularly too much, um, but like the trustees can whatever, make their money off. It just, it seems like it benefits everybody for art, art to be better. Uh, and uh, right. Right. for whatever reason we are, I mean, not for whatever reason. There's obvious reasons. We are not, mm -hmm. uh, we're not providing a environment in which good art can be made. In fact, we're like doing the opposite or something. Right. It just seems like a psyop almost, on some mm -hmm. level. Uh, yeah, but... that's the that's the thing. It's not. Um, like, yeah, yeah. Let's take like the what is the most cynical approach for this is that if you were running some type of a, um, you know, just really uh, a cynical scam on the art world, what you would want to produce assets that retained their value as they shot up 
uh, in, in their market price was that you'd want to have a level of uh, a high level of guarantee that that asset wasn't going to crash. Mm. Um, so you would probably farm out the research and design or A-B testing or this type of a thing um, to like uh, right. out the talent in the right. case of the art world. Right, 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 right. So, right. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is exactly it. And um, we'll say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention his name because he, um, uh, I think he, he ran a, ga- a great gallery and was uh, very generous in how he did support people. But we saw things like that happen in New York where there were struggling young galleries and medium-sized galleries um, sent out funding to a bunch of different smaller uh, kind of like bootstrapping young project spaces and then uh, paid their overhead in exchange for access to the artists who performed well. And so you could show at a project space, the cost was subsidized by the middle people, and then the middle people would get access to the inventory that was valuable, and there wouldn't be any conflict. There'd be a smaller commission or no commission. And um, that sustained itself for maybe like two years. Right. Uh, but, but what happened after that is that um, like speculative bubbles are so outrageously out of control in this specific era um, that like you can't even get a handle on, on the system. So when I used to try and hyperbolically get ahead of this uh, type of phenomena, the exaggerated, what I thought was too silly of a joke to be real, is I, I would suggest that David Zwerner would fund queer thought. Mm-hmm. And that's literally exactly what's happening through the platform uh, app. I, I don't know what you call it. It's just a platform uh, where there's an email blast that gets sent out to the David Zwerner collector base that shows the inventory from queer thought. Like right. that is, if not a direct subsidy, um, it's at least tapping into the same interest or the same level of market interest. So um, I think, I think what we're seeing is uh, a, again, a collapse in the middle, a, a pattern of wealth polarization of unsustainable um, um, market uh, phenomena, but also um, we're, we're about to enter a level of just power, just brutally. Uh, I mean, not even astroturfing itself, just like um, enforcing itself without the consent of the, the populace, without the consent of the audience, where it will just be, um, it will just be like naked power with no upward mobility for anybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then you don't have to, I mean, there's, there's a word for this too, which is uh, authoritarianism in, in the nicest sense. Um, <laughs> but we're, you know, we're, we're, I guess we're going to maintain the liberalism, but shed the, the democracy because you're not really going to be able to have meaningful input in, in any of these things. It will just be, um, the largest, uh, I hesitate to call them institutions, let's say the blue chip galleries, will pluck someone up out of total anonymity who's never had a show before, and the asset will go from zero to 100,000 without ever having been, been vetted, and it'll, instead it'll just be the guarantee of the name of the, the institution. This is, I think, broadly why like, right. anarchy is, um, is, is popular, because we're at such a dysfunctional phase of capitalism that... Um, it's, it's even difficult to like interrogate from a, a, a Marxist sense because it's um, it's really just like old necrotic power struggling to find ways to to maintain itself at, at this point. But yeah. again, that's the you know that's the provocation that you have to respond to by um, you know what are you going to do like accelerate the collapse and then um, okay. Peter Thiel literally goes to the bunker and you die. <laughs> you win. <laughs> Good job, bro. Like, yeah, congratulations. You tear down all the institutions and uh, now he emerges after the nukes and he's totally fine. His wealth is intact. Uh, there's probably still a bunch of Bitcoin, but you are, uh, you were poor before, but now you're dead. So is this really preferable? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's funny. I mean, there's, there's something, there's like a parallel to be made between like the way in which uh, these uh, like blue chip galleries are able to, um, I'm, I'm trying this out. Tell me if it's dumb, uh, like pull a uh, artist out of a blue, like out of a hat, a name of an artist out of a hat that's never been, seen before and like uh simkowitz their ass into like absolute like uh asset value stardom right from zero to 100k Mm -hmm. like on some level there's a similar similarity between that and like a a a tech company creating uh like being able to just like 
make policy like government uh, create like uh, rules and regulations around their platform that uh, is so like uh, it, it dictates so much uh, uh, what am I trying to say here the platform is so embedded in all of our lives that once the like uh, mm -hmm. the regulation on the platform end we get the policy gets created within the platform it becomes like almost a law right like that feels somewhat right. uh uh on par with like the ability of a, a, a gap a blue chip gallery to be able to just like there's like similar power plays being made to just like pull somebody out of a hat and be like this guy's worth 100k this guy's not worth anything anymore and like choose when and how that happens because of like how uh t a total uh, like uh, how much like a totality of uh influence that has right like uh in in terms of like creating lineage and like obviously one is uh the example of the tech company is something that affects every person on earth dealing with that thing whereas like the art world thing affects like us um but i, I guess i'm trying to make like a parallel between the two as like almost being the same cut from the same thread or something or probably mm -hmm. in, in bed together even yeah. maybe um but there's a yeah yeah well i mean there's um there's a wonderful video from um, uh, Simcoe is at the Nasher Center and he's talking to Amy Capolazzo and um, is it Schimmel? There's another, there's a, there's a blue chip uh, dealer on there uh, again. And, and in the context of that conversation, maybe it's something we'll, we'll, we'll revisit. Um, but he, he looks like the, um, he's the little guy. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the thing. I feel like the, um, his business plan essentially was like trying to recreate the uh, standard assembly line or vetting of an asset that uh, the galleries had failed to do because of how inflated the prices of real estate became. That the mid-tier in the Lower East Side, these mid-tier galleries could no longer afford their overhead, so they, they collapsed. Um, mm. and, and what he was able to do was through bringing in like sneaker collectors and like dentists and like people who were, uh, you know, comfortably uh, upper middle class or lower upper class, um, but were not like the old aristocracy that maybe Capolazzo and the, the auction houses sell to. He was able to stabilize like a Petra court right. Like this is really worth $10,000 because I've got 250 people who are waiting to buy one for $10,000. So uh, in, in the old uh, model that was, was kind of crumbling of the, the, the old way of doing things, um, you know, maybe there were like five people who were waiting to do it. And if those five people didn't want it when you called, then the assets uh, literally dropped to zero dollars. So right. his, his price valuations were much more um, robust, but it did, it did look very much like he was um, kind of, it looked like he was printing the money, but I actually understand it to be, be kind of the opposite way and that he just had a really good uh, press machine and understood like where the vulnerabilities were. And, and, and now I think, you know, the people he works with are um, you know, the market legitimizes itself. Once you get to the, to the top, there was a similar, I think you have to plot his emergence um, or his inputs alongside uh, another phenomena that happens almost uh, at the same time, maybe parallel uh, as a response to the crash of 2014 and, and 15, which was uh, the return to um, mostly older women artists who were producing work in the 70s and 80s, who had a um, inventory in a storage unit that was vintage from the years back when it was made. And so it, it, what we're looking at was, is like essentially like a boom and bust cycle in the emerging art market. And there were all of these, uh, th these artists who had had, uh, you know, shows, had their work stored away and um, for whatever reason had not um, been properly ushered into the market. Uh, this was a, a retreat to the gold standard of sorts in that um, where you could produce you could literally print the Michael Manning paintings and you could print 10 or you could print a hundred. And that essentially at a certain point had like the effect of diluting your currency where like the quarters today are made with a uh, 5% silver and they used to be all silver or, or whatever. It was just, it was not a strong enough asset because, you know, unlike the, um, 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 the, you know, a team of buyers who were, who were waiting to buy it, like the things, the things just it started to, to flop. Because uh, there were there were too many of them, they were overproduced. The mm. supply and demand curves didn't meet up. 
but instead you are able to re re uh, return to this thing that was um, there's only 20 of these pieces from 1976 by this artist who was in a few important group shows, had a small presence in museums, but was never brought into the market. And um, that was able to like, you know, um, wrap itself in the time with the, uh, uh, the, the culture wars instigated by, by social media of um, um, this uh, uh, whole extended world of, I don't want to uh, uh, attach it to selfie feminism, but um, broadly related to like, um, remember Elevator Gate and the, the docking, Dawkins, like uh, rational skepticism, all of these things that were, were burgeoning before, like the, the real era of um, uh, social media culture wars the, the first time around, mm -hmm. uh, pre-Gamergate stuff. But uh, m my understanding is that like in a market where the collectors were skeptical of the dealers because the dealers had oversold them on things that were no longer keeping their value, this was a much more solvent pitch in that there's only 20 of these things. They've been sitting in a storage unit for 30 years. Uh, you can't make more of them. So this will retain its current value and it will accumulate more in, in the future. Um, it was quite a wise, quite a wise business thing, uh, this, quite a wise, uh, wise uh, marketing strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like uh, you were take yeah, you were taking, I remember this pretty, I mean, like I, 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 I started paying attention towards the tail end of that and like towards the, like maybe the the more uh, transition towards like the Sim Simcoe being uh, mm -hmm. like responding to said thing, right? Um, but yeah, it's yeah. like why why not take something that was uh, that has been historicized in a specific way? Like you have the narrative. Um, that mm -hmm. narrative is easy mm -hmm. to sell to some sort of collector class of people because it's like I don't know, it's playing up in in it's it's using it poll and a number of other like cur current topics to market itself already and it's uh finite like it do it only there's only so much of it so yeah you get a couple of people interested yeah, it, was, it was the bitcoin to the uh to the ethereum of, yeah um, yeah of the fungible painting yeah <laughs> the, the problem is that the work was good also like the work was really good Totally. But I, I feel like the, the provocation is that, you know, it, it just wouldn't have happened unless there was a bust uh, immediately preceding it. What a fucking so bummer. That, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. I feel like I've, I've gone on now. I'm, um, um, I'm just I'm used to ranting at this point because. <laughs> no, I get it. I it before. <laughs> but uh, now it's an occupational hazard because I've spent too much time Twitch streaming. Um, what do you have on the schedule for tonight? Um, let's look at it. I'm going to pull it up right now and tell you, uh, where's my sketch? Schedule promo. Okay. So to close out this, it's 730 now. Um, my Uberman naps are like half an hour back. So after we're, after we wrap up, probably I'm going to do like another 30 minute nap. And then okay. we are into the 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 late night streaming which is a lot of um, oh, yeah. playing video games i'll probably be listening to some some heady podcasts to you know keep the brain moving and then theo uh triantifilitis is going to call okay. in he's in athens right now and he's going to call in at 1 a.m my time which is uh 4 a.m your guys's time i think everyone will be asleep by then but uh he's gonna keep me keep me company for a bit and then it's a lot of like me trying to stay up using this stupid U <laughs> U uberman nap program uh we'll see how that goes though chugging, chugging those bang energy drinks yeah yeah the thing with bang energy drinks is like your body will start to like shut down and go to sleep and every part of you will be like just go to sleep and then the the bang will just when you close your eyes start making your eyeballs vibrate um and that's the only thing that keeps you up actually it's not even the, the creatine and 300 milligrams of of caffeine it's just whatever they put That'll in to it. make your eyes vibrate that will do it yeah it's pretty fucked um but i think i, I i'm like getting to the point where i'm loopy as shit uh, <laughs> There's not much 
filtration happening between like my my brain and my my, my mouth um i've drank you're, the, you're you're in the medium state now you're just you're the oracle of our ancient tribal village and you've ingested mushrooms <laughs> spewing truth onto the tribe now the actual oracle of whatever tribal village we end up having is just somebody that drinks <laughs> copious amounts of bang energy drink yeah, yeah. <laughs> and starts just yeah, yeah. <laughs> seeing things um yeah i think i'll probably just keep gaming a little bit i I, I was planning on getting some actual work done today, but like, I won't lie. It's not easy to work on stream. I don't know how you did it for so long. No, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's I, not very productive. Um, I empathize. Yeah. 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 Well, you have to chat. It's like, it's a different thing. Um, well, here, mm -hmm. let me, if you, if you've got a nap after this and you're, you're in an endurance stream, so I'll maybe, let me, let me try and give a, a conclusion frame to our Please. conversation of uh, me furiously <laughs> ranting. <laughs> All right. So about, ch um, chat, here comes a fucking yeah. bomb. If, if you guys want clip, yeah. clip what's going to happen now. Basically what I want people to take away from this is that um, women artists are, are not talented and <laughs> female comedians aren't funny. And, and that's really, that's the gist of what I'm trying to communicate. That's to Joshua Citarella. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the quotable portion for all of this. Yeah. There's no market analysis. It's just, <laughs> it's pure, pure bioessentialism. That's uh, I'm a, I'm an evolutionary psychologist or uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's my belief system now. Um, no, no, but, but seriously, um, I feel like it's, it's super exciting to see this, um, th this project as like a, as a meme as a reality as like an extraordinary sculpture that is the the pc bed and um one of the things i feel like i've been super nostalgic in like uh, our conversation but just broadly in the last few uh weeks and months and thinking about this stuff but um i i'm just like of the age now where i'm starting to feel like i've seen different periods of new york i've seen different periods of the art world and i'm becoming acutely aware of like making um meaningful things about the time that we're in where like we're in basically like th we just lived through the period of reorganization where work and life collapsed into you in front of a laptop all day for a, a, a wide group of people, not everybody, I understand that, but a lot of people, that's what it was. For all the students, it's, I mean, it's very, very common experience. And I feel like this work prefigures um, how much work is going to get so quickly. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be surprised if there's not some example of like the thing that you have satirically, hyperbolically prototyped through this process just becoming a, a reality at some place in in the world in in the next few years where you know you live in the pod you eat the bugs and that is the extent of your life uh yeah but i feel like it's the right time it's like such an exciting thing to be a part of i'm super stoked to like just <laughs> call in and uh and riff and i'm really excited for the stuff that we're building um and and i feel like um this is uh, such a more interesting thing than the way that the rest of the art world has chosen to respond to it and um it would give me you know great great satisfaction to um you know a, a pr preserve this artwork this endurance piece this this stream as like the thing that is uh, uh emblematic that that envelope all of the like emergent crises, the contradictions of the time, the anxieties of the time. And yeah, I just can't express enough like how much of a, I'm a little bit fanning out now and I feel kind of self-conscious about it, but I just think it's the coolest fucking thing. Uh, and it's so cool. And like, if the, the museums aren't putting this kind of a program on, then it's, it's honestly their loss. Cause I think this is like the most exciting thing that has happened uh, for a very, very long time. Damn. That is that is very sweet, Josh. Thank you very much. I really, I really appreciate. It means a lot to me coming from from you and and and, and uh, as someone who I've looked up to over the years, I really, I really do take that to heart. Thank you very much. 
I'm glad I'm not on the video because I'm blushing a little bit. Oh, <laughs> good. But both of us are, except I'm on video. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. No, you're fine. You're fine. Um, it's it's great. It's great to talk to you. Um, I'm. I want to let you nap. Um, and, and, and chug your next energy drink. I hope you don't OD on them. There's, there's, there's a, like a legal limit or something from the FDA. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's been, it's been great hanging out and, um, I'll let you get some rest as you prepare for the, the, the final lap of your endurance project. Thank you so much, Josh. All right. Talk soon, Flip. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. The distance between my bed and my workstation is two feet. I could wake up and not touch the floor and get in my chair. For a while now, my life has existed in the vector of motion between my bed and my desk, where all my daily activity happens at these two points. Before, the studio was where the lines between art and gaming would blur, and occasionally waged work would make its way back. But ever since I've been working from home, a new player has entered the arena, so to speak. Work, art, gaming, pleasure. All of these things had collapsed into a single computer in my 10 by 12 foot bedroom, and switching between them only required to switch the way I would think about them. I had become optimized and my life had been made streamlined. But these two feet of space between my bed and my computer really felt inefficient. It felt like I needed to close that gap. So I did. I asked, what if it all collapsed? What if I could do all of this and not leave bed? What if I took the next step to optimize it? Bed PC is that next step. It is the attempt to close the gap. It's leading with the bed in the effort to fully transform the living conditions towards a borderless life of work, art, and play. <laughs>